Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ask the Expert event. Today, we'll be, we'll, we will be learning about yoga with expert Michael James Wong. I'm so excited to be your host. My name is Marilyn Shera, and I'm a reporter with GBH News and a passionate yogini, I might add. Thank you to everyone who is joining us today, including our leadership circle and RLS members. We appreciate your continued and generous support. So now before we get started, a couple of housekeeping issues. I'd like to say as a friendly reminder that unlike us, you will not be on video and we will not be able to hear you or see you, but we do want to know your questions. That's why we're here after all. If you have a question you'd like to ask our expert, you have to open the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Many of you are probably familiar with this. It's the Q&A tab at the bottom of the screen and you have to type in your question. As always, we'd love to know where you're tuning in from, your location. So when you submit your question, please be sure to let us know where you're watching the event from, wherever it is. If you're in Foxborough, Massachusetts or in California somewhere. If you see a question and you'd want to hear that answer, give us that thumbs up emoji uh, at the top of the Q&A. That'll be really helpful so we can uh, join in and support, be supportive of that question. Now, one other thing to tune into the, the closed captioning feature, which we are offering, click the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. There are two transcription display options that will pop up. And we recommend that you select the subtitle to enable captioning at the bottom of the screen, but you can also select full transcript. And if you do that, a sidebar window will open up where you can see what each speaker is saying. That's also helpful. So please bear in mind though, with the transcription and the closed captioning, there might be a slight delay. So without any further ado, please, it is my pleasure to introduce Michael James Wong. And there he is, hello, Michael. Now, Michael is founder of Just Breathe and a leading voice in the global movement for modern mindfulness. He's an author, speaker, community leader, and of course, yoga meditation teacher, who's dedicated to really expanding the conversation around the mind and mental health. May, of course, is Mental Health and Wellness Month. Michael is internationally recognized for his work in the wellness community as both an advocate and entrepreneur. He writes books about hope, and is the founder of At Just Breathe, At Boys of Yoga, At Sunday School Yoga, all places that I have visited, and I can't wait to talk and hear more about them. And he's also the voice behind the well-loved Just Breathe Meditation app. Welcome, Michael. It's so nice to meet you virtually. Hey, Marilyn. Nice to be here. Thank you so much for the kind invitation and introduction. So excited about this webinar. We have so many people joining us today to learn more about Just Breathe, about all of your apps and your books and your experience. So tell us more about uh, yoga. So many questions come up when people hear you practicing yoga, you're interested in yoga. When people ask you, what is yoga? Can I do it? How will it benefit me? How do you respond? Sure. I mean, hi everyone, and welcome to the webinar. I think maybe the best way to, to start is to, to give you a little context of kind of how it started for me and, and how I grew up and, and maybe how yoga came into my life. Um, I was born in New Zealand and uh, at a very early age, my family moved to Santa Monica, California, where I was raised uh, and first introduced to yoga in my late teenage years, early, early 20s. And uh, fast forward just to now, I do live in London now, um, but I kind of consider all these places home. And for me, yoga was always something that was never, um, never kind of obvious to me. Granted, you know, I grew up in Los Angeles, which is one of the, let's call it Western centers of yoga. And while it was all around me, you know, I was probably atypical, uh, you know, I was sorry, I was a very typical kind of teenager, young adult. and play sports, go out with my friends, do all the normal things that you would do, uh, maybe living in Santa Monica near the beach. And kind of in those later teenage years, I had a friend who kind of said, hey, why don't you come to yoga? And I said, you know what? I'm not sure. I feel like I'm getting enough out of playing soccer, playing basketball and doing all the other activities that I would normally do. And I was almost in that sense, and this was a, lot, a long time ago, just challenged to just try. And for me, that's where everything shifted because yoga at its fundamental essence is really just about a practice. It's a connection, right? Yoga, as maybe we know, is an Eastern practice and it has an Eastern translation of, of yoga really coming from this root word of connection and union. And this sense of understanding what it means to be connected to ourselves and this very present moment. 
And so for me, being in LA at the time, it was something that was completely different than anything else. It kind of knocked me sideways. And it was a really, um, you know, big introduction for me because all of my teachers at the time said, it's not about winning. It's not about succeeding. It's just about experiencing. And that for me has always been a, a very important part of the practice for me as a student and then eventually as a teacher over these last kind of 13, 14 years to really encourage and remember that it's always about the experience. It's always about having accessibility and really just having a, uh, you know, a space in which we can just experience the practice and find that deep connection that's more than trying to achieve anything. And what would you say, Michael, is the best way to get started? Some people are intimidated. Oh, yoga, I've never done it. I'm not flexible. People always say it hurts. How do you respond to that? Yeah, I mean, it is. The, these are all very classic and common questions. And I think where it comes from is as humans, we just don't like to be bad at things. We don't like to start at the bottom. We don't like to look like a fool. And so oftentimes these are just things that we put up as defense mechanisms or ways to convince ourselves we're not ready and it goes back to the idea of if we can first maybe recognize in our minds that it's not about being good, it's not about succeeding, and maybe we might feel we're not flexible or we maybe feel that actually, you know, I'm too busy to do yoga or meditation. All these types of things are actually blockages we put in our own path. And it's, it's coming back to that simple place of maybe just try and then go from there and see what unfolds. I think a lot of time for people who kind of go with the age old cliche of, you know, we say, oh, I'm not flexible enough to do yoga. That's the same thing of going, oh, I'm too dirty to take a shower. I'm too hungry to have a meal. And so the irony there is actually, if that's you, then yoga is a really beneficial practice for you. It's just about getting past that point of self-criticism or judgment or, or challenge to think that you need to be good straight away. A question that comes up sometimes is what style of yoga? You know, you hear there are many different styles. There's uh, vinyasa, there's ashtanga. You know, how do you, how do you define that and, and explain it? <laughs> well, I mean, I always come from the first part that any yoga is better than no yoga, right? Mm -hmm. And so when we look at styles of yoga and without getting too much into the classical interpretation of all the different styles of the practice, we first want to recognize that a lot of the styles that we find in the Western practice, Ashtanga, Vinyasa, Hatha, these are all, let's call it, um, different apples from the same tree. And so anytime from a Western perspective, when we see the practice in a studio, on a yoga mat, that's all coming from the essence of what we call Raja Yoga. And that has birthed a lot of styles that are both classical styles, Hatha, right? And that have then created extensions or expansions when we look at Ashtanga and Vinyasa, rocket yoga, uh, power yoga, all of these things that actually have created uh, wider um, conversations or new doorways into the practice. And so what I tend to say is just go to your local studio or class and ask to take a beginner's practice, right? And oftentimes it's not style-based because oftentimes when we start with a beginner's practice or maybe a foundational practice, in all of those practices across the board, 99 out of 100 times, you're learning basic fundamentals that apply across all styles. How to keep the spine supported, how to ground the feet, how to breathe with quality, right? How to ensure that we're actually paying attention and focusing. Because a lot of the core parts of the practice are internal. A lot of the core parts of yoga is where's the mind? Where's the attention? What is the intention? And stylistically, when we look at all these different variable styles of practice, Oftentimes that relates to what order are we doing the poses in? What mantras or chants are we saying intermixed? Who started that style? Where did it start? What teachers created a style? And so you get these different flavors. And so if we think that all apples from the same tree, but then as we grow through the different styles, it's kind of taking all those apples and then making 17 different types of apple pie. And so mm -hmm. sometimes we get confused with, what kind of apple pie, as opposed to let's just have an apple and see if we like it. Mm -hmm. And what about just breathe, which I love the title of that because so much of yoga involves breathing and that mindfulness. Can you define that, explain it to us, how important breathing is and the aspect of mindfulness? Well, I mean, thank you for saying that. It's so kind to hear that. You know, just breathe is first and foremost, a community for people 
to connect to mindfulness and meditation in the real world. So a lot of times we see yoga in studios, in festivals, in events, and that's wonderful if that's really comfortable for you, if you're in an mm -hmm. environment or a community where that's safe and accessible. But for a lot of people who maybe just work a nine to five or they live in a part of town that doesn't have yoga as a prevalent thing, sometimes those places can feel inaccessible. So Just Breathe was about bringing it out of the studio into the real world. And so it started as an event series and as a community series. We anchored it first here in London, but it's obviously expanded globally. And it was really about giving people a safe space to come and just be together as human beings, to have very simple, gentle conversation, to sit and listen to music, to hear inspiring talks, and then to be introduced to meditation. And maybe now, in 2021, people are a bit more comfortable in those spaces. Five, six years ago, it was like asking people to go to Antarctica, right? Come into this room where you're going to have a conversation with some strangers, listen to some spoken word, and do some meditation, right? In our yoga communities, that was very common, and everyone loved it and was happy with that. You kind of walk that to a different side of town, and people go, whoa, that's a big thing. And so it was about creating a space where it was consistently there so people could feel welcome and then from there it grew into a really big community we started with about 30 40 50 people and at the second event there was 300 people by the fifth event there was a thousand people then we started doing big cultural collaborations and it was really about how do we show life in a very simplistic way that shows all the aspects of mindfulness in ways that you can experience in your life, art, music, culture, dance, song, conversation, talks. And that's really what kind of birthed our, our community of Just Breathe, which is now obviously expanded to really supportive in a both offline and online way with our meditation app, the Just Breathe meditation app, which is a huge way in which we kind of support people with more uh, in-pocket practices. And it really comes from the spirit and the essence of, of what yoga is and what Just Breathe is all about, because fundamentally it is founded on the principles of yoga, right? On pranayama, on pratyahara, dharana, dhyana. These are the aspects or the limbs of yoga that are more than the physical or deeper than the physical and give us that space to deep connection, subtleness, and gentleness. And it's been such an exciting path watching yoga expand you know, globally, uh, and, and especially during a global pandemic where people needed to be mindful, to breathe, to help uh, mental health and to relax and to allow themselves this time. Um, how exciting has it been for you to, to see this, this burst, burst of growth within the yoga community? It, it's been really wonderful to watch. I mean, I, I've been around the maybe wider context of the community since about, 2001 um, when I first started practicing in, in, in California and in those early days it was kind of 10 odd studios and yoga was just in those communities and granted it was like that in all little pockets of the world over the last 10 years uh, or 20 years it expanded there were now bigger events festivals communities all these kind of things and then in the last kind of 18 months, it's had another big expansion with all of the online digital classes that are available. Granted, because of the situation, that's kind of what has forced that kind of shift and, and transition. And now it's been really beautiful, especially for me being in London, is I can still practice with all of my teachers uh, who, who are in California, all of my friends who are all over the world. And on a Monday, I can practice in Australia. On a Tuesday, I can practice... <laughs> in Sweden on a Wednesday I can practice in San Francisco. It's wonderful. And, yeah, and it's such a beautiful thing. You know, I, I, I'm a, a travel teacher a lot of the times where before the, the pandemic, I would be in 25 different countries every year. And so I would have that ability to, to, to go out and connect with other people. And this has been really beautiful because it actually allows everyone in the world to have that immediate connection to communities all around the world. Absolutely. Well, we do have some questions from those joining us on the webinar. Just a reminder, the Q&A tab is at the bottom of your screen. If you have a question for Michael, please put it into our chat and we will ask the question. Let's try to get to some of these and we'll get back to um, talking with Michael. Uh, let's see, we have a couple of great ones from Waltham, Massachusetts. Uh, where, how should I start as a member of the 60 plus age group? That is a great question. And I'm a huge, huge advocate of starting yoga at any age. And I think the number one thing that is one of the most important things that we must know 
when we're practicing yoga, and I'm going to say practicing yoga in a Western context, is if it's not accessible, it's not yoga. That's my belief. And if we're in this, if you're at that age or 60 plus or just of any age where you feel like you're ready to begin, it's remove the ambition to have to do what anyone else is doing and really go back to the fundamentals of what makes you feel good in the body, in the breath, in the mind, in the moment. And a lot of times the most simple and basic things about a yoga practice are the best things that are going to support your life, right? When you get to a certain age, you don't need to be running, you know, five miles every day. It's, you know, you want to be able to pick up your kids and grandkids. You want to be able to, you know, spend your time walking through nature. And the practice of yoga is to support keeping us fit and healthy and well in the body without the ambition or the need to achieve. But at the same time, it really has a beautiful way of supporting us and guiding us to remember that it's about what makes us feel good. It's not about what everyone else thinks we should be doing. So if you're in that category of age, or if you're in a beginner's category, regardless of age, is go back to the idea of just start simply. Right? Just take a foundations class, find a class in a, in a lot of places all over the world, especially if you live in a big, big city like Boston, where, where you guys are anchored at. A lot of studios will have foundation practices. They'll have practices for age groups. They'll have practices for specific needs. And so it's best thing to do is ask questions or you can simply use online as a great tool and you can Google your local areas. You know, studios that are great for foundation classes, practices that are good for this. And that's what's beautiful about yoga is that it's not a one trick pony. There are so many things that are uh, out there. It's just about asking questions and taking time to maybe share what's important for you. You'll know so, you're in the right place, yeah. Good answer, thank you very much, that's helpful. All right, we have Joanne Rhodes. Uh, yoga poses for bone health, please. And she says, namaste, <laughs> as you answer. <laughs> and so I, first, I think it's important to qualify the fact that uh, I'm not a doctor or a clinical expert. And I think that's also important in this format and a public format where, sure. where I'm going to answer these questions as best to my ability and capacity, but also purely as a recommendation coming from a, a yoga meditation teacher. And so I think it's worth recognizing that for everyone as well. Um, when we look at questions, uh, or sorry, when we're asking about questions for things like bone health or just general uh, skeletal health, we want to think about postures that build stability. We want to think about postures that create um, strength and density in the body. And so what we want to actually do is shy away from postures that have high impact, high load, or ask you to twist and turn yourself into shapes that maybe can... Uh, push us to extremes that might not be necessary. So when we look at things like uh, bone health and muscle health, I'm a massive advocate of, of foundational practices. And this is where we find practices um, uh, of basic sun salutational series, postures that don't require a huge amount of standing strength or inversion strength. Um, my background as a teacher is a vinyasa teacher, so I come from a, a lineage of looking at anatomical strength and stability and mobility, but using it in a way that it's functional and valuable for your life. And so this sort of answers your question, and it doesn't, because I don't want to be so specific to give a, a recommendation in that sense, but I would say foundational poses, sun salutational poses, poses that give you uh, strength, uh, and, and stability are always going to be great for creating bone density, strength, and support. Thank you. All right, more questions. Sandy Chin is asking, did you make any changes to your diet in your journey? Great question. I think uh, when you've been practicing as long as I have and teaching as long as I have, you've tried many, many things. <laughs> um, so when, we, when I think about diet, I think about maybe the things I put into my body. Uh, me personally, I have a... Uh, a yearly ritual where I remove something from my diet or my personal kind of intake. And that's both a practice of physical health, but also mental health, clarity, spiritual connection. And so for example, for a year, um, I didn't drink coffee. For a year, I didn't eat chocolate, right? For a year, I didn't eat meat and I was vegan vegetarian for a different year and so mm -hmm. for those for me you know and, and a lot of times yoga i've done all those <laughs> yoga is yeah. with certain stereotypes and expectations and i want to come from the place of you make your own choices on where you draw the line on what's 
what's important for you, what's valuable for you. I found for me that, you know, taking something out and shifting a lifestyle works when you do it with longevity and it's more than just about the object or the subject and it's about behavior change it's about um social change or the way you interact with social uh, mm -hmm. etiquette it's the way that you just reframe and for me that's actually the value of a yoga practice is constant and continuous self-awareness and that's where these shifts have really been valuable for me and, and discipline oops and discipline yeah, Absolutely. Discipline. All right. Another question from Natalie Kinnear. Uh, I'm about 5.5 months pregnant, she says now, and was wondering what kind of yoga would be a good fit for me? Is there anything I should avoid doing in yoga? This goes kind of back to that question where you said you're not a doctor, but oh, yeah. you can answer and it. And so sure. Natalie, uh, the, the, obvious answer, the obvious answer is going to be, I can only advise you anecdotally for obvious reasons. Um, and so the first thing I always say, if you are pregnant is speak to your doctor. They're gonna have some good clinical advice on what things are gonna be relevant for you specifically. That being said, in most, uh, as far as I'm aware, most studios in big cities or in, 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 big, in, in big hubs are gonna have prenatal classes. <clears throat> and a prenatal class is a yoga class specifically designed for pregnant women, where the postures are specific the sequence is specific, but mm -hmm. you also get a lot of information and education about how to support yourself pre and post birth. So I would say, Natalie, look for prenatal classes. Um, and if for some reason they don't exist where you are, I'm not sure where you are in the world, look for restorative based classes. So restorative yoga is gentle. It's uh. subtle. It's supportive. A lot of props are used. And things that we want to avoid are things that don't support you. Um, sometimes teachers will say, don't do inversions, don't do headstand, all these kind of things. And it would be unfair for me to say any of these things to you, A, because I don't know you yet mm -hmm. in life, but also you have to decide and figure out what's relevant for you. Um, what, what, uh, maybe a nice anecdote that one teacher I know used to say, and, and it, take it with a grain of salt because it's supposed to be done humorously, is that her, her standing rule of thumb is don't squish the baby. <laughs> right. And if we think about that, just in, in the in the lesson right. from that, you just want to think you're practicing for two. And so anything you do, you want to be super supportive to ensure everyone is OK. Good answer. I like that. All right. Well, remember questions. You can go down to the bottom of your tab where the Q&A is and put your question in. Tell us where you're um, where you are, where your location is, where you're tuning from. Next question is from Thomas Byrne. He says over a decade ago, I was studying a student of BKS Iyengar and he was great. Unfortunately, he moved back to India. I'd like to begin again, but had two kyphoplasty operations three years ago, repairing two collapsed vertebrae and now have no core strength. My surgeon encouraged me doing gentle yoga. I don't know where to begin, especially how to choose a studio. Ooh. Wonderful. Uh, yeah. First of all, um, you know, wonderful that you're back in this place where yoga is, is interesting for you. I mean, that's a beautiful story. And obviously, um, you know, that lineage of having time to practice by Angar was a very special time. So I myself am very jealous of that time that you, you had to practice by Angar. What I will say is coming back from an injury or transitioning from an injury um, or surgery as you had is quite a big thing physically. And so obviously you're going to lack that core strength. You're going to lack a different sense of physical strength. But actually what we tend to lose is the awareness of our, our physical functionality. And so the challenge is going to be is getting back into that place of being comfortable with the body as it moves and supports you. And so the best thing is to do is to not rush, to be gentle, but also to build strength and stability and, and awareness in your practices. So again, I don't know where you are in the world, but I will say is if there is a studio nearby, the best thing you can do is to show up before class and just share your story. This is where I'm at. This is my situation. This is where I feel I want to do. And 99 out of 100 times again, the studios are gonna be able to recommend great classes or specialized teachers who are going to be able to support you. Mm -hmm. Yoga teachers are very learned in their disciplines. And so a lot of times teachers are also human. A lot of times, all teachers are humans. <laughs> they, all, they, all, 
from personal mm-hmm. experiences. And maybe one of the best things that you might strike lucky at is having a teacher who has had a similar injury or has worked in that, or maybe has a cross discipline in things like physiotherapy that are really gonna help you build that strength, but also confidence and clarity. So my, my recommendation to you is go have a conversation at your local studio and um, if they're doing their job well, they'll support you or point you in the direction of those who can. Well, like so many places around the country, we have great studios here in the Northeast in the Boston, Massachusetts, Rhode Island area. So I'm sure they can find something. All right, we have another question and we thank you for keep the questions coming. Some great questions. Uh, this one is from Lynn Murphy. I like this. I loved your Instagram feed when you were yoga dancing and air quotes with a woman. How did you learn that dance and how can I start it? Uh, well, to give context, so uh, I teach a variety of styles of practice, and one of the styles of practice that I ha- have come to teach um, is, is a style called ladder flows, and this is the connection of building um, short sequences that we stack on top of each other, very similar to like a choreography for a dance, and then link it to music. It's something that I have, have developed and, te- and taught a lot over the last five or six years, mostly in the UK and Europe, purely because of this where I'm based when we were doing those events. Um, it's a very, you can find this style all over the world. Ladder flow classes are very prevalent as a style of learning. It's a great way to challenge the mind to remember sequences. I teach it connected with music because it creates a different lift and level of the experience. Um, and I, I don't actually know many places that teach it similar way. And perhaps that's why people connect with it and enjoy that style of practice. What I will say is if you drop me a message on either Instagram or on my website, I will send you and everyone else who is interested a class that we have on, or class that I have on a private Vimeo link, which will take you through a one hour practice that I'm more than happy to share. And if that interests you, I can then point you to more resources like that. All right, thank you. Next question we have Carol Loom, she, her, hers. Uh, She asks, as we slowly emerge from COVID land, do you have any recommendations about online yoga? People still have interest in it because I guess it brings us together. Absolutely. Online yoga is a very wonderful resource for two types of people, I believe. People who are starting the practice and it's a lower entry, a lower barrier of entry to begin, right? You're in the comfort and security of your own home. You can turn it on and off at your, at your pleasure or displeasure. And you can really just take time to sometimes even just sit, listen, or look. And that's really helpful when you're beginning. I remember when I first started yoga, that obviously that, that feeling of awkwardness of what am I doing? What should I be doing? Everyone seems to know what they're doing. And Marilyn, you probably have experienced this too. And you just kind of bit, you know, you feel like a fish out of water because everyone else is arms up, arms out, chair pose. And you're like, I don't speak the language, right? And so we have these little moments of awkwardness when we're starting to begin. So online is a, is a wonderful resource for that. It's also a great resource for people who have a a dedicated practice, who want to stay consistent, discipline, learn and develop. That now during COVID times, there has been an explosion of the amount of online resources of classes. And I think that's really wonderful. My recommendation though, if you are new to the practice, use resources that are are valid, are supported, are, um, are not just kind of a single teacher, maybe uh, at home, and making sure that you, you're, you're starting to learn with teachers who have a very strong way of supporting you through the screen, because it's a different style of teachers. And these are platforms that you can try of like Yoga Glow and Allo Moves, um, you know, there's Live Kick, which does live classes, um, Udaya, which is another uh, platform which I have classes on as well, classes on different places. But these kind of places are gonna be great because you get to try lots of styles and lots of different teachers. But of course, if you have a family friend who's a yoga teacher and you wanna give that a try, I always tend to say any yoga is better than no yoga. So it's a great place to, to practice if it's available for you. Well, Michael, we are 30 minutes into this event and we're having an amazing conversation. Thank you for all of your comments and explanations. And we have so many questions. I want to try and move it along, get to some of them. Uh, One uh, from Angela, she says, I uh, teach yin yoga. Your thoughts, please. I love yin yoga. I also teach yin yoga as a practice. 
I think yin yoga is such a necessary practice now more than ever. Yin yoga and restorative yoga, uh, similar but different in their own practices. Yin yoga is oftentimes about finding the edge through stillness and through depth. Restorative yoga is, is finding the gentleness and the ease through stillness and support. Both practices are highly supportive. You know, they are really valuable, not just for people who have a busy mind and a busy schedule or, you know, are hardcore athletes or physical people, but also for people who practice dynamic yoga, vinyasa yoga. Mm -hmm. What yin yoga does, it teaches us how to find our stillness through challenge, but also, you know, through comfort. And for a lot of people, stillness sometimes is pleasure and pain. It's one or the other or both. And yoga is a, and yin yoga is such a beautiful discipline to do that. And I'm a huge advocate for uh, practicing yin yoga. And I tend to say, if you practice dynamic vinyasa two, uh, more than twice or three times a week, your fourth class should be yin yoga. You should be adding in yin yoga at least 25 to 30 <laughs> a third of your practices during the week because yin yoga helps to undo the work that you're putting into the body. I love it. I love it. I have tried yin yoga and restorative. And I was, if I can say just real quickly before we go to the next question, you know, you're so used to the power yoga and the vinyasa to try and complement it with something else is so beneficial. So I love that answer. Uh, speaking of which, the next question is we have um, Sandy Chin says, how important is flexibility in yoga? I feel that some folks may steer away from participating in yoga for fear of not being flexible enough. What might you say? It's, it's a common, uh, um, common. That, that people say. Very common. I, I think maybe the misfortune of Western yoga is that flexibility becomes the marketing tool for yoga, when I believe actually flexibility is part of what I would consider the holy trinity of the practice, which is flexibility, mobility, and stability. So that is strength, movement, and the ability to move in motion. That's what flexibility is. And so I think sometimes we can be tempted to think that we need to be flexible in yoga, and if it makes you feel better, I couldn't touch my toes for the longest time. And most <laughs> some days I still can't. And the reality is, you know, the practice of yoga, the physical practice, getting more flexible, perhaps, getting stronger, perhaps, becoming more mobile, right, is really to support everything else in your life, right? I would like to think that we practice yoga so we can still tie our shoes in 20 years. We don't practice yoga so we can put our foot behind our head right? A lot of times the practice on the mat is to support the rest of your life, right? It's to allow you to practice yoga and then go home for dinner and your partner or your roommate goes, hey, you just seem a bit nicer today. Or, you know, you practice yoga. So over the weekend, you can go for that hike and make it all the way through and still feel like you're having a good time. And so if we lean too much into thinking that flexibility is the ambition or the goal, then we're actually missing out on the rest of the view of the practice. And so I, I always say is put that aside. Don't look at that magazine or photo or Instagram or whatever, and just realize that yoga is a practice that's supporting you and your lifestyle. And if we can combine flexibility, stability, and mobility, what we're doing is supporting the 360 view of our life and lifestyle. And although those people that can have that flexibility to put their foot behind their head is wonderful, it's, it can be a goal. And um, I love and admire those that can do it. Well, we have so many great questions and we wanna thank our audience with all the questions. Uh, we do wanna take a moment to introduce my colleague, Jamie. Welcome, Jamie. It's nice to have you join us. Thank you very much. Namaste, namaste. <laughs> oh, I said it Na wrong. I was namaste. So listening to this conversation, it just relaxed my tongue. <laughs> Thank you, Jamie. Yes, I don't think there's a wrong way to say namaste. It's a greeting, a salute. Uh, thank you for joining us, Jamie. And please share with our audience ways that they, if they're enjoying this webinar, how they can support us and continue these great programs. I would love to, thank you. So thanks to everybody at home for spending some time with us today while we talked to our special guest, Michael James Wong, about yoga and mindfulness. Virtual events like this one are made possible because of audience support. And today we're asking for your support. If you feel that GBH news and entertainment leaves you feeling more aware and more mindful of what's happening in our state, in our country, in the world, 
then we please ask you to make a donation. Today, if you donate $90 all at once or decide to give $7.50 a month as a GBH sustainer, we will send you Michael James Wong's book, Sit Down and Be Quiet, as a token of our appreciation. So no, this is not a parenting guide um, for naughty children. This is a book all <laughs> about yoga. You are going to love it. Um, it's the modern guide to yoga and mindful living. It's great for people that are just beginning their yoga journey. And it's really inspirational because it talks about the many benefits for the mind and the body of practicing yoga. So this is definitely something you're going to want to add to your collection of books. And it is signed by our yoga expert himself. So there are two ways to make a donation today. We have a text option and we also have an online option. First, I'm gonna tell you how to text. So if you'd like to donate using our text function, just text GBH to 800-492-1111. Again, text GBH to 800-492-1111. If you prefer to make your donation online, simply go to gbh.org slash support events. And there should be a nice little link there in our chat tab uh, instructing you how to link to that site directly. You need a little extra help. <laughs> so, so every dollar donors give um, really helps provide more free programs and great events to our community. And as we approach the end of our fiscal year, you know, contributing today will help us make our fundraising goals for the year and will help ensure a tomorrow full of more great programs and more great events through GBH. So we hope you will decide to donate and if you're already a member, we thank you so much for your support. We are sincerely grateful for it. And now with that, um, I guess it's time for the second half of our Ask the Expert with GBH's own, Marilyn Scherer, and our yoga expert, Michael James Wong. Thank you so much, Jamie, for that. That's right, please. We thank you and encourage you to continue to support GBH in these type of programs. I'm excited about the book, Michael, Sit Down and Be Quiet. That is going to go out to those of you that can support us today by texting GBH or giving us a call. And we thank you for the donation and the opportunity to hear an expert like Michael talk about such a great um, practice of yoga, wellness, uh, meditation, mindfulness, um, Michael, this book, Sit Down and Be Quiet, when did you write it and, and, and how fulfilling was it for you to take all of what you know and put it into this book? Uh, well, thank you both for saying that. Um, this book came out actually in 2018 as part of our Boys of Yoga project, which was really about celebrating a way in which we encourage both men and women to the same space in the yoga community. So in the book, you'll find a lot of resources uh, for new beginners into the practice. There's a lot of inspiring stories uh, of, of men uh, who, who are teachers in the practice, but it's a resource for men and for women. It, it's really a great place for people to realize the practice is for everyone. And it's something that was really inspiring to write and to be able to bring a lot of teachings into the same place um, was such a beautiful way to be able to share. Well, we are pleased, Jamie, thank you. Well, uh, for, uh, for those people that can make the donation to provide as our gift. Uh, we thank you for your continued support. How about we get back to some questions now? We have so many still great questions. Go down to the tab at the bottom for the Q&A. Uh, Jeanette Kutash, I hope I'm saying that right, Jeanette. Uh, her question is, I need classes that are a little more verbal because of no vision. Therefore, large classes are not necessarily a good option. What books or audio options would you recommend for those of us who need good, complete verbal descriptions to continue to increase yoga learning? Will any of your books fit into that category? Well, I mean, uh, Jeanette, it's a wonderful question. Thank you for asking. Um, uh, I think the easiest way to maybe answer this is, is uh, if I take a little a small assumption that you're okay with online things, and as you said, audio things, there are some really wonderful resources and online classes that are out there that are both suited and situated for uh, ensuring as, uh, as, as much accessibility for everyone as possible. Um, two great examples I'll give you uh, as far as online classes. 
Um, one is Yoga Glow, which is an online class, which is probably one of the, the oldest ones that's been around. I'm sure, Marilyn, you've heard of it. A lot of people have used it, and there's some amazing and wonderful teachers on there. Um, I'll specifically call out a few teachers that I believe that would suit you really well and serve because they do teach in a very uh, specific verbal way to be really hyper articulate with what they're asking of you in a supportive way. Um, those two teachers I'm going to call out there would be uh, Annie Carpenter who is recognized as one of the most senior Western teachers of yoga anatomy and just a wonderful teacher. She's also my teacher. So that's, I guess, a bonus of, of a shout out. And Jason Crandell is another wonderful teacher there. Very similar as well, really focusing on sure that we have the understanding of our anatomy and our physical movements to support. The other resource, which is a new resource, which has actually just come out last year, which is done by a bigger brand and organization, which is all the Apple Fitness Plus stuff that is just uh, oh. recently launched around the world. And I say this for a few reasons, not because um, uh, it's maybe uh, a big, big resource, but it is very easily accessible. Um, the teachers who teach yoga on there are actually all of all of my friends that I know very well. Literally, one of my best friends on there. His name is Dustin Brown. He's the yoga teacher, as well as two London-based teachers, Janelle Lewis and Jessica Sky, are wonderful teachers. But the platform has made it really accessible, where every class is closed captioned, every class has ASL translation, every class is verbally led and has a visual uh, demonstration by the teacher and to support teachers that give you both options and modifications wow. for all body sizes, all body types, all accessibility. And so they have done a really wonderful job of really widening the accessibility of the practice. So as, Fantastic. Far, as, the, wow. as far as an online resource, you, uh, at this juncture, I would be hard to find something more suitable for 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 accessibility for everyone. And they have classes designed for beginners, for um, dedicated practitioners, for uh, people in, in their older years, for people with certain disabilities. And, and so there is such a good supportive thing there. Another resource that is, is wonderful is there are a lot of podcasts that are out there and a lot of books. Um, mm -hmm. If I was to steer you towards maybe a few book authors that can be really helpful, Richard Rosen, who's considered one of the you know, um, you know, godfathers of Western yoga, an amazing teacher who's in the 70s or 80s now has written uh, half a dozen, if not more books really about the practice of you know, yoga for the breath, yoga for the mind, yoga for the body, all of these things. And you're going to find some beautiful resources with his collection um, and, you know, podcasts like Yoga Land and other things. And uh, I believe uh, Mind Body Green, there's some really wonderful podcasts out there. Um, to dig around to tune into. A wealth of information. Many of you, if you're following along in the chat, the Yoga Glow that Michael mentioned and Apple Fitness Plus is also in there. So uh, we thank you for having that available. All right, uh, good question here. And I think there've been a couple of comments. Sharon Bernard from Fitchburg Public Library, Fitchburg that is, Fitchburg Mass, she, her pronouns. She wants to know about the book that's displayed behind you. I think it's over your right shoulder. Um, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you for asking. I mean, very, <clears throat> very serendipitously, this is this is my second book, which uh, is called Sen Bazura, which is Small Steps to Hope, Healing, and Happiness, which is a, a, a collection of short stories, proverbs, meditations, um, and it will be out in about eighteen countries around the world over the next kind of nine months, and so it. Uh, is released in the UK and parts of Europe uh, literally next week, but in North America, not until September. Um, All right. You can we'll find it on website. We'll have to the, look for that then. Thank you. All right. Not really a question, but Angela is in Rhode Island. She says she's 70 years old. She said she loves yin, was a massage therapist, no more, but I continue to teach. So that was her comment. I wanted to share that. Uh, and then we have... Uh, Sako Burr, she said, oh, she wants to know that answer to your personal um, disclosure of after a year of no coffee, why did you go back on it? <laughs> did I go back on it? Well, I mean, funnily enough, when I, when I, when I do those uh, kind of cleanses or kind of what in yoga we call like a Kriya or our modern version of a Kriya, um, I usually go, uh, after I finish the year, I bring it back into my life. And that's also so there isn't kind of this stigma of longevity and it's really about a practice that has an end coffee is actually one of the few things that has carried on so i actually haven't had coffee since 2018 wow um, <laughs> uh, and it's literally like 100 zero uh, 
kind of, I think I've smelled coffee a few times and that's about it. Wow. It's the first few months that gets you after that, you're all right. You're right. I I gave it up for for Lent uh, for a period of 40 days and I did tea and actually I enjoyed it. It was a nice thing to try. All right, we have, let's get back to some questions. We still have so many more. Lisa Del Champs, as a follow-up to feeling good in yoga, I find yin yoga very challenging, staying in the poses for so long, she defined it, trying to find the balance between getting the most out of the class, but not overdoing it. Overdoing it is, um, is that something people need to be concerned about? Yeah, I think overdoing it first happens in the mind. And I think oftentimes where we find the most challenge in yoga, in yoga is b- being up here, trying to be somewhere and be still. It also does have a physical relationship. And so oftentimes if we find that sense of challenge is what we tend to say is to, to come back or pull back. And I, I tend to teach from a principle of practice at 85%, never at 100 And so in yin yoga, even if the teacher says, okay, well, stay in this forward fold and you're there just trying to force yourself into a forward fold for four minutes, that is going to be challenging. And your mind's going to be challenged twice as much because you're trying harder or not doing what you think you should be doing. So back it off and just allow yourself to be in the pose as opposed to try to do the pose. Mm -hmm. And can we just circle back, uh, Michael, to mindfulness? How... Mm -hmm is mindfulness when you're practicing your yoga and, and, and being present? Yeah, I mean, presence and awareness is at the root of the yoga practice and arguably the root of our life. We want to think that if we can cultivate the way in which we are completely present all the time, then we're actually living our life as opposed to thinking about our life or considering the past or whatever comes next. And so when we look at it in a physical asana practice, in a yoga practice, in a class, mindfulness, which effectively can be talked about as uh, our full attention and awareness in the moment without judgment. And that's, that's the big part, the without judgment is being in a practice where we're not judging how good am I? Is this working? Am I doing it right? Am I breathing enough? But also not needing to go, where are we going next? Have I done this before? What, do I, what am I having for lunch after this? Do I need to call Marilyn back? Right? And we <laughs> go through our mind a million times. And so, so true. My, in the practice is just simply allowing yourself to be in the practice or maybe within the confines of your inhale and exhale, we sometimes will say. Mm-hmm. And that really is the, is the spirit of the practice and the foundation of the practice and arguably the foundations that we can take into the rest of our lives. All right, here's our next comment question, Virginia Inglis. She says, I do what I can in gentle yoga at Down Under in Newtonville, Massachusetts, and she does it online. I'm almost 80 with arthritis and poor vision. And I guess my question that she might be asking is really as you are age, you can almost continue to, to do yoga in, you know, and, and stick with it in any form, fashion. And isn't that kind of like a goal is, is to be able to practice for as long as you can to keep you, you know, supple, your body supple and using your body and your mind. Absolutely. I mean, as we get older and we're all at different ages and generation and, and, and my, my parents are almost that age as well. And, you know, the suppleness, as you described it, Marilyn, the ability to function, the priorities of our physical output change as we get older or change at different ages of our life. What we need to do at 35, we don't need to do when we're 55. We don't need to do when we're 75. And so as we are in different ages in our lives, the functions that we have can be supported in different ways. And if you are at that stage in your life when your physical output is actually more about going for a lovely walk in the park, and that's the big movement of the day, wonderful. Your yoga doesn't need to be strenuous right? It needs to be, can I still keep myself moving forward? Am I comfortable in the arms and the shoulders? Can I keep myself upright in these types of things? I tend to think that, you know, the more that we practice consistently, the more it supports our life consistently. And so doing gentle, simple, basic yoga for 10, 15 minutes a day, every day is far better than trying to do something for two hours once a month. Right? It's the same thing as like brushing your teeth. Do it every day for five minutes as opposed to, you know, 60 minutes once a month, right? It, we can start to recognize incremental value supports overall well-being. 
Great. Well, we still have 10 minutes left in the webinar. If you have questions, go to the bottom of the tab. You can ask our expert, Michael James Wong, any question you have about uh, his, his books that are out, about yoga practicing in general, many of his uh, Instagram uh, sites. Uh, you, now's the time to ask the question. We have another question here from Sylvia Peretz. Uh, she, this is a good one. Uh, she says, the website does not seem to have a contact link, so I can't see a way to send you a message. You meaning you, Michael. I don't use Facebook or Instagram, so a website contact email link would be helpful. Is there something you can provide everybody with that they can reach, to, reach out to you? Yes, I can provide better admin of myself in the background. <laughs> um, thank you for saying that. I should probably check that. But the simplest way is my website, my personal website is Michael James Wong, just like my name. Uh, to find me directly, you literally just put hello at Michael James Wong, and that will go straight and straight to, to me. Um, oh. But thank you for mentioning that. If you do use things like uh, Facebook and Instagram, Instagram probably most specifically for me, you can always find me there. I, I tend to find, and this is kind of one of the, the fun stories of my life, that my first name is Michael, my middle name is James, and my last name is Wong. And so I go by Michael James Wong, because if you remove the James, there's about 50,000 Michael Wongs in the world. Maybe you know another one. And if you Google Michael Wong, I believe it's a magician or an actor that comes up first, <laughs> and neither one is me. And so since I've been about you know 18, I've always used my middle name as well, just because it's a bit easier to find me. Absolutely, yes. And I loved the Instagram sites, the Boys of Yoga, the Sunday School Yoga, excellent uh, um, uh, opportunity to see what Michael does and, and, and his philosophy and his practice. All right, we have a couple of questions, still a few minutes left. Uh, if you have a question, get it in now so that you can um, ask the expert. Uh, Laura Buffone says, is it okay to ask a yoga teacher not to push me into a pose? I know it is to help me. And there's been a change of philosophy, Michael, and you could probably expand on this about the touch. You know, some people love it, some people may not. What, what do you suggest? Absolutely. <clears throat> I think it's a very important question. And I'm gonna talk yes. about it in the context of pre-COVID where obviously touch now is obviously layered even a different thing. You should never feel like you are being told, expected, or to do anything in a yoga practice. You do not need to have anyone touch you in a way that's uncomfortable for you, to push you in any posture that they that is not comfortable for you or accessible for you. I, I teach a very specific teacher training. So most of my work in the yoga community is teaching and supporting teachers as they grow and develop, which is the essence of our Sunday School Yoga program, which we do have a lot of online courses. But the fundamental essence is no one knows your body better than you do. And so never give that right to anyone else to tell them what you should be doing in a practice. So if, if a teacher is well-trained in touch and assisting, they should know and they will know that the first rule of thumb is respect. And you need to, as a student and as a practitioner, you need to abide by that and respect yourself more than you respect the teacher. And this can be breaking maybe a little bit of old lineage and tradition is that respect yourself first. If you feel uncomfortable, you have every right to say, please stop, please stop right now. You don't need to do it in a vicious way because obviously they might not be doing it in a malicious way, but it purely can be, please stop right now. That's not going to work for me. And that's mm -hmm. okay. And people need to respect that at a very human level. And you need to protect that as a human being when you're in a yoga practice. And, and along those lines, is it a good idea before the class starts, if there's time to let the yoga teacher know that you might have an injury or so if they see you not being able to do something that they're aware of it, do you suggest yeah, that? I do suggest that. I also put the, that responsibility on the teacher. If you are a teacher, you, I believe that you hold the responsibility to ask and offer the space for your students to make themselves, to make you aware of their considerations because as a teacher, we're in the service industry, we're in hospitality, we're here to support our students. We're not there for them to look up to us and go do everything, I'm gonna do everything you say. So as a teacher, I believe, welcome to classes, or if there's anything anyone wants to let me know, please do so. Uh, I'm gonna be assisting today and touching you to support your practices. If that doesn't work for you, maybe just put your hand up when everyone's uh, in, in child's pose. Don't make it a big thing on show, but just create the space so people can let you know what they're comfortable with. And that's a responsibility as a teacher, but also if that space isn't offered as a student, take that priority to do so as well. 
All right, as we're winding things down, still want to get to a few more questions. Uh, for those that may have joined late, they may not have heard your introduction about your experience. So Ray has asked, how were you first introduced to yoga? Meaning you, Michael. Yeah. Sure. I mean, keeping it quick, I grew up in Los Angeles where yoga was all around and the community was strong there. And even back in the 90s, the 80s and the 90s when I grew up, um, it was prevalent. There were a lot of studios. And I was first introduced by a, a, a few friends who kind of invited and challenged me to come to class. At the time, I was a teenager, and so I was a bit resistant. Um, and I was lucky enough to have strong friends and personalities who said, hey, just come give it a try. From there, I was sold. <laughs> there you go. All right, we have uh, five minutes left. Thomas Byrne is asking, speaking of training, which you talked extensively about, for what should I look for in an instructor? An example, are there uh, degrees, certifications that are important? That's a great question. Absolutely. So they're, 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 the closest thing to a standard uh, globally is the Yoga Alliance format of training to become a teacher, which is the first stage is the 200 hour teacher training and then the additional 300 hour teacher training, which equals your 500 hour certification. Those are the two main certifications usually in, in North America and globally. Um, schools that are registered give you a little bit of peace of mind that the curriculum is going to be valid and, is, and, and uphold a certain standard. I mm -hmm. would always think, uh, ask your local studios, ask your favorite teachers, do, do they teach trainings? If they do, wonderful, inquire more. I always say it's best to learn from someone you like and you like how they teach. If that's not available for you and you don't have those resources around you, then you, know, you, you want to find uh, people that are qualified and, and people that specialize in teaching teacher trainings. For example, um, there are some teachers who might teach one training a year, um, but there's maybe specialists like I, I teach 15 to 20 trainings a year and I have wow. for the 10 years. And it's really about focusing not just on the content, but ensuring that you are supported in how you're learning how to teach the content as well. And that's a lot of the work that we do at Sunday School Yoga. So um, you can always message me <clears throat> there or through, through my email. And I can uh, dive deeper into send you some resources. We also have online trainings and there are a lot of online trainings that do that as well. All right, very short on time. One quick question, Carol Lum, she, her, hers. How do I think about regular yoga practice as a beginner versus rigorous exercise, aerobic or weight training, alternate days, something else? How do you respond to that quickly? Um, getting my, my quick response to that is going to think that as a yoga practice, we want to do it daily. Yoga practice doesn't have to be physical, sweaty, and exerting. We want to use yoga practice for beginners as a way to start to settle the mind and allow us to really feel comfortable on the mat and in the body. If you feel like you need more, go for a run. All right. Uh, Sandy Chin, do you need to rest for a certain time? You kind of touched upon this a little bit in between yoga classes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, your body knows the answer to that. If you feel like you can do more, do more. If you feel like you need to rest, rest. Listen to the body, don't overthink it. All right, uh, we have time. I'm just gonna ask you real quick. Someone wants to know about your puppy, Lynn Murphy. Did you have a puppy? I have a little puppy named Gus. Thank you Lynn, for asking. He's somewhere else in the house, but if you look on my Instagram, he's there all the time. All right, so we learned so much about you, Michael. This was an absolutely amazing conversation. Uh, you can connect with Michael after the event. How, Michael? Best ways to find me are on Instagram at Michael James Wong, at Just Breathe, at Boys of Yoga, at Sunday School Yoga, super easy. Or if you literally just Google my name, Michael James Wong, I'm pretty sure I'm the only one around. And if you type in yoga after that, you'll end up finding your way there to my website. Um, and super easy. The other way to find me is on the Just Breathe app, which is our app for mindfulness meditation and lots of daily practices. And I know there's a way we're going to support everyone, but please find out and check it out. And um, I'm sure if you are looking for me, you'll find me. A wonderful conversation. I've learned so much. I've enjoyed meeting with you. We had so many guests and so many questions. Uh, you can reach Michael in so many ways. And again, if you're supporting programs like this through GBH, uh, his book is available for those uh, as a gift that can support us here with their generous donations. Uh, the book is Sit Down and Be Quiet. Michael, it's been such a pleasure to speak with you, to learn so much about you and about the practice of yoga during uh, this special month of May of uh, mental health and wellness. Well, it's been a pleasure to be with you. Thank you, Marilyn. Thank you, GBH, for putting it on. Thanks, Ray, Thomas, Sandy, Carol, anyone else who asks questions. Uh, it's always so nice to connect everyone. And please do connect up on social media or, or websites. I'd love to stay connected and support any way I can. And we are connected throughout the world nowadays. So thank you again. Thanks, everybody. This has been wonderful. I appreciate it. 
and I've enjoyed it. Thank you, Michael. Thank you.